Good morning, good morning, everybody. Man, I am excited to be here. I've been wanting to come here for a little while. We are at the Alamance Battleground State Historic Site in North Carolina. We're hoping the connectivity might stay uh, uh, out long enough so that we can show you this very cool site and teach you some things maybe you didn't know before. I'm Gary Edelman, you're with the American Battlefield Trust. That's Chris White behind the camera. And we are lucky to be here right uh, just about at Alamance 250. Um, you know, you already might remember that Boston Massacre 250 already happened. You might know that there's some other 250 stuff coming up. Uh, and we'll really encourage you to stay in tune with uh, 250, especially as what, might, what people might consider the main deal, sort of, you know, Declaration of Independence 250, or even before that, Lexington and Concord 250. Maybe the nation could come together just a little bit more than it has been of late. So um, obviously here we are at Alamance, there's gonna be a 250 here right away, so I suppose it must be the first battle of the American Revolution, or is it? Uh, to talk about that and a bunch of other things before Chris White comes out behind the camera, let's introduce Jeremiah De Gennaro, uh, uh, De Gennaro, the site manager here at Alamance. Come on, where are we? Thanks, Gary. So we are at Alamance Battleground, which is in Burlington, North Carolina. And this is the site of a battle that took place, as Gary mentioned, almost 250 years ago exactly, on May 16th, 1771. And a lot of people think this is the first battle of the revolution, but that is not so. This is actually the culminating battle of something called the North Carolina Regulator Movement, also known as the War of Regulation. This is a social protest movement among farmers in the backcountry of North Carolina who organize, they protest, and as their protests go unanswered, they eventually become so angry and so frustrated that they become violent, and that violence begets violence from the colonial government. And the royal governor, William Tryon, organizes a militia, marches out to the backcountry, and fights a battle here on May 16th. And when that battle takes place, there are over 3,000 people engaged, 2,000 regulators, and 1,000 militia. All right, that was a Great start and a great opening here today. So thank you, thank you for uh, joining us here on the American Battlefield Trust Facebook page. Please share this with your friends, with your family. Check out Alamance. Uh, Google that on uh, Google, and you can go over there and check out everything they're going to be doing here for their anniversary. And Jeremiah will talk about that in a few minutes. But before we get there, let's talk just for a, a minute about North Carolina in the 1760s, because this isn't um, you know just taking place in 1771, which is mm -hmm. the battle. Battle took place in May. What's happening in the 1760s? You know, what is the catalyst for all of this? Is it taxation without representation like we always hear? Is it a corrupt local government? Uh, is a little bit of everything that we're talking about? Yeah, I guess my answer would be yes. Uh, in uh, the 1760s in North Carolina, there's an established Eastern elite that are uh, running the government. They are in charge of the courts. They have the positions of power. And then in the Western counties, you have an influx that is not coming from the East. They're actually coming down from Pennsylvania, from Virginia via the Great Wagon Road. And they are uh, moving into these areas in the back country of North Carolina. They are trying to set up small farms and trying to make uh, an economy based on small local farmers, uh, but they are constantly running into uh, wealthy land speculators. Those land speculators are also the movers and shakers of North Carolina politics. They control the courts. And so this regulation that comes up starting in 1765 and 1766, uh, they, it's an organization against what they feel to be a government that is protecting a wealthy few rather than protecting the working many. It's so when we're talking about, you know, North Carolina settlement too, we're talking about people coming in from the east who are, you know, we've yes. colonized coming in from around Wilmington, New Bern, Bath, other places like that, and then moving in. So who are some of these settlers we're thinking about? Um, you know, the Scots, the Irish, Scots-Irish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we have the Jacobite Uprising, which is taking place over in Great Britain. So there's a lot of different moving parts that will bring people to North Carolina and who will eventually play a role here in, in right. the War of Regulation. Right, yeah, you do have a large English population. You do have Scots-Irish that are settling uh, around the Rowan County, uh, around the Charlotte uh, area. And then you also have a very large German population that is coming in. Uh, and of these different um, 
uh, communities that are emerging in the backcountry, you have many different groups of dissenters. So you think of uh, uh, New Light Presbyterians, German Pietists, you have large Quaker communities, and then you have uh, this exploding Baptist movement uh, in North Carolina. All of these dissenters who have no problem upsetting the established order, letting them know, uh, letting the people in power know how they feel, uh, it leads to a situation where there is great conflict in the backcountry, uh, between the backcountry and the Eastern establishment. And if I may, from behind the camera, speaking of community, uh, hello to everybody. We have people from Scotland, from England, from Japan, and Eric Cole says, hi, Chris and gang. Uh, we've got many locals from North Carolina too, uh, so take it away, Chris. All right, so let, let's think about this just for, uh, for a minute. We have all these settlers coming in and now there's you know unrest. Where does this come from? Where does the war regulation now start? So we, we know it's over taxation, but it's not on the larger level like we see up in Boston complaining about indirect taxes like tariffs. It's not direct taxes like we see with the Stamp Act, um, which would tax uh, anything from a marriage document to playing cards. This seems more like a political ring where you have a corrupt sheriff. I always call one guy named Edwin Fanning the sheriff of Nottingham down here. He's the guy who's, who's kind of uh, stirring the pot, as it were. And then he's working with the local lawyers, he's working with the local judges. It seems like everyone's kicking back to other people. And is that kind of how it's happening? It starts with try on a little bit maybe, but he's not against it. He's not for it, but he's not against it. But everyone else below him who's been appointed by royal governors kind of seem to be corrupt. Right. Yeah, you use the word, the term ring, and that's exactly what the regulators call it. They refer to this courthouse ring in which you have uh, different people who are uh, those wealthy land speculators who are holding multiple offices. They are uh, officers of the court, and they are doing things that, um, while it's related to taxation, uh, it has more to do with predatory behavior uh, and extortion in which uh, excessive fees are being charged. Those officials are pocketing the money. Taxes are being collected. No receipts are being given these officials are pocketing the money and as one regulator says it's enough to make us turn rebels and those economic uh, pressures that are being placed on these small farmers is causing them to uh, buck against the system and one more note about taxation they don't have a problem with paying taxes they do have a problem with paying taxes not knowing where the money is going to go uh, they also have a problem with what uh, today we would call regressive taxation where taxes are uh, flat across the board and are not based on someone's income. That was a very progressive thing that the regulators were act, uh, asking for, uh, taxes based on your income. And I've read stories of the taxation where they're, what we're talking about is, you know, the, the sheriff or someone will show up and say, hey, we, you owe us X amount of dollars. Uh, okay, well, I have to go down the road to get it from Bob. Let me go get that. And in the meantime, the sheriff might take your horse go over to Hillsborough real fast, which is the county seat of Orange County at the time. Today, this is Alamance County. Uh, became Alamance County around 1849. And then by the time you get to Hillsborough to say, hey, give me my horse back, the sheriff's already sold it off to his buddy. So is there a lot of that going on down here yeah, as well? Yeah, there is. What, what's known at the time is distraint, uh, uh, property confiscation to settle some of these debts. Uh, and that happens uh, and it creates a, a circle of debt that farmers get locked into. And again, those economic pressures uh, force them uh, into um, uh, a, a lot of uh, anger. Uh, and so in the case of uh, a horse being taken, that is a documented thing that happened during the regulator movement. And when one of the regulator's horses was taken uh, and uh, sent to Hillsboro to be auctioned off, a large group of regulators descended on the town and they got the horse back. And on the way out of town, they found that uh, local official, Edmund Fanning, his home, and they fired shots uh, into it with their, uh, with their, um, their muskets. And uh, so that escalation of violence is ultimately what leads this social protest movement to a battle here at Alamance Battleground. Hey, that's a great lead. And, and Fanning, I know that they even write a song about him at one point where uh, he showed up in town on a, you know, basically a broken down horse and a, a threadbare coat, but now it's lined with gold mm -hmm. uh, because of, you know, all of his corruption here. So yeah, I'm not a good singer, but uh, I, I know the words to it. Oh, come on. <laughs> let's hear it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, he's not oh, going to do it. Yeah. He no, was I'm thinking really, about it. Not, yeah, I'm not a singer, though. While we're messing around here, hello, Jim from Boston and uh, Butch from Frankfort, Kentucky, and Susan, who says it is the first battle of the revolution, dot, 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 dot. What's about this battle? 
so the, so we, we were talking about this before we started where we look at this as a you know basically a, a local level almost a civil war uh taking place here and this will carry over into the revolutionary war for sure that mm -hmm. some of the the bad blood um we'll have people who uh become famous later on in the war you know uh, john Pyle, we were Pyle's defeat he's out here um as part of the forces then david caldwell who's a local preacher actually has a monument uh, at guilford courthouse he helps to attend the wounded at the 1781 battle but 10 years prior he's here at alamance trying to act as an intermediary at a point so let's bring this to to a head uh, as it were let's let's come to the battle of alamance so we've had a problem in hillsborough we have william tryon who is the governor colonial governor of um of North Carolina who's about to move up to New York. He's about to, to head out of here, but he's gonna go and send a word over to the Privy Council that he wants to come up with this idea called the Johnston Riot Act, where he can call out the militia and, and, and unleash them on the populace. And it's not popular with the Privy Council, I know, but he's gonna do it anyways. Uh, so how do we get from, you know, we're, we're protesting, we're going back and get our horses, we might be firing at Fanning's house. How do we get to a point where we have two armed, uh, an armed militia and an armed, mob in a way mm -hmm. coming out here to fight at Alamance. Yeah, uh, when this this regulator movement becomes a regulator crisis in September of 1770 when the Superior Court is in session in Hillsboro, uh, there was already a lot of uh, mistrust around the court in the previous um, uh, previous session in the spring and um, in the September session, a mob of regulators descend on the town and they break open the doors to the courthouse, start dragging out the court officials, including Edmund Fanning, and beating them up in the streets. After those officials are able to escape, they then go to Edmund Fanning's house and they physically tear it down. They, uh, to quote one source, they cut the house from its sill. And once the violence reaches that level, Governor Tryon realizes he's lost complete control over the backcountry, and he escalates the situation by calling for this uh, riot act, which is written by Samuel Johnston, hence the uh, Johnston Riot Act. And it provides money for a militia uh, to be raised, and it also allows for uh, this riot act to be read to a group that is in unlawful assembly, uh, and it gives them one hour to disperse. If they do not disperse, then Governor Tryon will fire uh, into any unlawful assemblies and so he finds an unlawful assembly on this hillside behind me on May 16th 1771 approximately 2,000 people uh, regulators are congregated here and the reason why they're able to marshal so many people is because when Tryon uh, forms his militia they march out into the backcountry into hostile territory and there are people who are watching this happen and word gets out to the regulators so quickly that they are able to choose the ground on which they are going to fight and so they choose a hillside. One officer in Tryon's militia notes that it is the only uh, ground in this area that they could not obtain without action. And so the regulators came to fight. So when we, we come out here to for the battle, I mean, Tryon's well known. You know, he is the colonial governor. He's also building a big palace, as they've dubbed it, over in New Bern. Yeah. So, you know, he's not a beloved guy. He's about to go off to New York, so now he's down here almost setting off a, a civil war mm -hmm. uh, w within the colony. Uh, so what are we going to roll out here? We're, we're going to have what? We have a few cannon. We have a cannon over here by, mm -hmm. by Gary. So we do have, with the militia, we have at least two cannon that right. come out here. Yeah. Um, we also have how many men? A thousand men? So what? there's a thousand men, and there's uh, there's eight artillery pieces that eight. he uses. And um, uh, obviously artillery is going to give you the biggest advantage on an 18th century battlefield. Tryon is at a numerical disadvantage here with only a thousand militia against 2,000 regulators. Uh, and so he writes to Thomas Gage, the uh, British military commander in New York, and he requests artillery, and he receives two three-pound field pieces, and then he invents a field piece for this battle, and he has uh, half-pound swivel guns taken from the ramparts of Fort Johnston near modern-day Southport, North Carolina, and he has those mounted onto carriages. So he has eight artillery pieces total that he's using to rake the uh, regulator's position with grape shot. And, and if, uh, so you know a three-pounder gun, they'll use two of those at Guilford Courthouse where it would be later today. They're known as grasshoppers. There's a few different reasons they call them grasshoppers. Whenever they fire them, their legs look like they shake like a grasshopper. There's another story where if you fire it, it'll jump backwards so far, it's like a grasshopper. And the swivel guns are essentially anti-personnel weapons of the time. All cannon are, but these are much more 
or in close battles. So if you think about pirate ships, you think about fighting on the high seas, these swivel guns are meant to get in close and actually fire anything that they can out canister style um, to try to cut swaths in, in folks. So as we stand on this hillside here, looking out over over the battlefield, is that seems like what the plan's gonna be. Am I correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, there are some uh, accounts of the battle that say that Governor Tryon gives the order to fire uh, and the militia, uh, the infantry, as it were, uh, hesitates. Um, that, that is possibly because the largest contingent of the militia is the Orange County Detachment. That's the same county that the regulators are from. In some cases, you have people on the militia who know the regulators who are on the other side. Uh, but so Governor Tryon hinges his strategy around the artillery. He takes those six swivel guns and he puts them right in the center of his line to bolster that first line of militia. And then he takes those two bigger guns, the three pound field pieces, and he puts them on both ends of his flanks because he's concerned about the regulators rushing around and uh, taking him from behind. And speaking about the, the on, for the regular side, um, there's a story of a guy named James Pugh who's out here who, who gets behind a rock and allegedly shoots 15, 16, uh, you know, the militiamen. You know, is this fanciful story? Is this uh, one of those stories that may be true, may not be true? You know, what's happening on the regulator side uh, mm -hmm. of the line? Yes, yeah, great question. Uh, and the story of James Pugh is one where all of the accounts are from about 50 years after the battle, so we gotta take it with a very big grain of salt. Uh, in fact, research has shown that James Pugh, who was allegedly hanged in Hillsborough on June 19th, 1771, was alive and well into the early 19th century, but his brother, Enoch Pugh, who was also a regulator, uh, disappears from the historic record after 1770, 1771. So it'll let you decide uh, what happened there. So um, on the regulator side, uh, the um, officials of the governor uh, of course, have to read the riot act literally uh, to this group, order them to disperse, and the regulators, uh, by all accounts, try to egg them on and try to bring the battle on. And so they. Uh, as the riot act is being read to them, they shout out, battle, battle. They shout out, fire and be damned. As the militia is waiting for the hour to elapse, regulators are coming up uh, within a few yards of the militia and they're opening their shirts, burying their chests, saying, here we are. If you're go going to fire, go ahead and fire on us now. And of course, Tryon obliges and he orders his artillery to open up on the regulator position. Once that happens, anyone who does not have a weapon, uh, flees the field. Uh, those Quakers who are in the regulator movement, they probably flee the field uh, as well. And once that happens, the regulator force is severely diminished and it becomes uh, what is uh, described as bush fighting. And so uh, this area originally was uh, open woods. It was uh, not improved acreage or, or open farmland. And so there was uh, lots of fighting uh, between uh, rocks and trees. And uh, for about 45 minutes, the fighting here is static between the artillery and regulators who are firing from undercover and so th there's other stories that come out uh, of Tryon actually executing in cold blood a prisoner so there's supposed to be a prisoner exchange that had taken place and that may have been the catalyst for part of this battle as well where the regulators had captured two of his officers or so and then there were about 11 or so regulators captured and they talk about this this truce and maybe we exchange these guys and then Tryon thinks that he's being duped and they're coming around their, their, his, his flanks uh, and he allegedly shoots someone in cold blood. You know, again, is this one of those fanciful stories of, of uh, you know, building up the enemy or could this have happened or not? Yeah, uh, the man in question is Robert Thompson, uh, who was a regulator. He is uh, one of the leaders who is trying to broker some kind of communication between the two. And um, as the story goes, he uh, tries to flee when he is still under guard. And someone, uh, some people say Governor Tryon, shoot him in the back. And his death is what causes the regulators to be so angry uh, and uh, so, so willing to fight during this time. And there are some uh, accounts of this that take place you know, 50 years after the battle. However, there is one letter from a member of North Carolina's elite uh, only a few weeks after the battle that does mention uh, this rumor that Governor Tryon had executed Robert Thompson in cold blood as he was trying to flee back towards his lines and the regulators. Yeah. 
Uh, you're with the American Battlefield Trust, and I just want to say that, uh, you know, only because there are about six North Carolinians watching are you able to overtake those from the UK watching. Uh, my <laughs> compliments, include, especially to Ian the Bruce uh, from Scotland. I, the the was of my addition. And let me just say, uh, we've got uh, our friend Bill from uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi. We've got Georgia represented and all sorts of other things. Continue, guys. All right. And I was going to say, please share this with your friends and with your family. So what we're going to do now is uh, let's wrap up this battle and let's talk about the aftermath. What, what's the long term impact here mm -hmm. in North Carolina and what, what's the short term impact on some of these regulators? So how long is this battle? We talked about it beforehand, right. but we got to tell the audience um, and, you know, what is going to happen afterwards? You know, yeah. we, have, we know we have a new governor coming in. Josiah Martin will take over. Uh, for try on but what's going to happen to these people who are staying in North Carolina who served in this regulator movement? Yeah, great question. And so after that 45 minutes of fighting, the uh, regulators are starting to be weakened. Governor Tryon orders his uh, militia line forward and they start mopping up that regulator camp and they continue uh, on uh, further west down uh, the old trading path road here and they disperse those regulators. After the battle, Governor Tryon goes on a punitive march through the western counties of North Carolina and he intends to capture regulator leaders uh, to take um, oaths of allegiance from regulators. <laughs> I'm going to hold for that. Please no. do. All yeah. right. And that's a very loud siren, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So. Uh, as he marches through the western counties, he's capturing regulator leaders, he's taking oaths of allegiance, and he offers to any regulators uh, that if they swear to not take up arms against the government, if they pay any outstanding taxes, if they surrender up their arms, nothing more will be said. There are a few people, leaders of the movement, who are accepted uh, from this offer, but um, for the most part, it includes everybody in the backcountry, and so thousands of people come into Tryon's camp as he's undergoing this uh, march, and uh, he receives uh, thousands uh, of these oaths of allegiance. And that effectively ends the regulator movement uh, through force, but um, as Chris mentioned, Governor Tryon is uh, leaving almost immediately to take up the governorship of New York, and his successor, Josiah Martin, takes an almost completely different tack, and he, uh, shortly after taking office, he comes to the backcountry and he starts meeting with some of these uh, former regulators and he realizes, hey, some of these issues that they have, there's some validity to them. Uh, and he starts trying to make changes. Um, part of that is trying to win the uh, loyalty of the backcountry because there is a coming conflict with the North Carolina elite in the East. Uh, so when the revolution starts, a very odd thing happens. And this is why we do not consider the regulator war to be part of the revolutionary war. Uh, the sides do not exactly switch, but they do get jumbled around. And so a lot of the officers in Tryon's militia here at the Battle of Alamance become North Carolina's revolutionaries. So North Carolina's revolutionary governor, Richard Caswell, uh, he is here at Alamance. The um, uh, Orange County uh, Infantry is being led by Francis Nash. He becomes a officer in the Continental Army. And so, uh, likewise, regulators who see these now revolutionaries standing um, uh, against them, they decide to become loyalists. And so people like uh, John Pyle, a regulator leader named uh, Jeremiah Field, they get involved in the revolution from the Tory side and uh, at the Battle of Moores Creek near Wilmington, a large contingent of regulators are there fighting for the king. So this is complex stuff. This is just great. Uh, and I've got a few things I want to do here. First of all, it's good to see so many friends still coming. Uh, Beverly, haven't seen you in a little while. Good to see you. Uh, Petoskey, Michigan, I've been there and I've certainly been to this Illinois boy has been to Naperville, Illinois. So this is just great. Now, we hope that you're watching and this is interesting to you, uh, but we really hope that you might actually want to learn more about the regulator movement and about Alamance. And you have a 250th coming up. So first of all, where are we compared to say Raleigh or Greensboro and what's going on here in a couple of weeks? 
Yeah, so um, uh, geographically we're located between Greensboro and Durham in the Piedmont of North Carolina uh, in Burlington. And uh, for our 250th anniversary, the weekend of May 15th and 16th, we're going to be having a virtual uh, program. There's going to be videos with living history, uh, artillery demonstrations. We uh, also have a series of interviews with regulator, uh, excuse me, historians who have written about the regulators over the past 20 years, reflecting on what it all meant. Uh, we're talking about 18th century medicine. Uh, we are talking about anything and everything related to the regulation. And it's all going to be very accessible for everybody uh, at home across the country. So uh, we highly recommend that you go to the Alamance Battleground State Historic Site Facebook page. And we will be posting uh, content all that week leading up to the events on May 15th and 16th. And if you're in Piedmont, North Carolina, on the evening of May 15th, I invite you to come to the site as we have an in-person event this is going to be uh, very special. It's going to be the battlefield illumination. And we're going to have luminaries posted on the battlefield, marking the positions of both the regulators and Tryon's militia. So it'll be a uh, very unique way to visualize the battlefield, how the battle looked, and we're going to have uh, one lantern representing every 10 people that were engaged in the battle for a total of 300. So I, I invite you, if you're able to, come to Burlington uh, in Alamance Battleground State Historic Site the evening of May 15th. It is a Saturday uh, and uh, come talk to us. We would love to tell you a little bit more about this amazing story uh, in North Carolina's pre-revolutionary history. Good. Thanks again. This is Jeremiah DeGenero, and he's not off the hook quite yet because I got to bring something up here. Of course, you know, I'm a fan of the show Outlander. I'm also a Gettysburg Battlefield guide, so I know what it's like when a movie or a show comes up and everybody thinks that that one thing happened or it's the most important thing. So first of all, Outlander, by the way, I love the show. A little rough to get through season two, but I recommend it nonetheless. And they actually unpack loyalties, Jacobites and then regulators and, and, and British loyalties very well, actually. Um, so Outlander, good thing, and how true is it? How close do they get? Uh Outlander has been a great thing for us. It has uh, really given us the opportunity to talk with audiences who never would have come to Alamance Battleground. And so we're very thankful for that uh, audience and that community that has uh, grown up around our site. Um, with that said, uh, is the depiction of the Battle of Alamance on the Outlander TV show the best depiction of the battle? No, not quite. Uh, there are some things that they do get right. Actually, I would say that the landscape that they portray is probably closer to how this site looked in the 18th century than what it does now. What's behind me is a pine barren. Uh, those are uh, pine trees that were planted in the 1920s. Uh, really, that would have been old growth forest uh, and uh, just a, a lot of woods. And they do a good job representing that. The combat isn't quite uh, as correct, uh, but one thing that they did show that I was very excited about was uh, moving away from showing Tryon's militia being entirely in redcoats and being dressed as British regula uh, regulars. These were not British regulars. These were volunteers of the North Carolina militia. These were citizens wearing their everyday clothing. They show that uh, in um, the Outlander TV show, and they also show a very important note, the uh, yellow cockades that are uh, worn in the hat. Those helped to differentiate the militia because they looked exactly the same as the regulators. Uh, and so there needed to be some kind of identifier of the militia. Outlander shows that, and I was very excited to see it. Good, and you heard it here. Barbara, Allie, and other Outlander fans. Outlander, 100% accurate. You heard it from the site <laughs> manager here. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, well, this is great. And I, one last thing before we maybe do a little walk around. Uh, Thomas noted the battlefield illumination sounds pretty cool. It's so cool. If you haven't been to an illumination, we put it in our 150 things you absolutely have to do, um, you know, uh, in, in our little book there. Here comes probably that same uh, or another another ambulance so it's only going to get louder so we're going to keep talking anyway so um uh, and and lastly uh, hello to my friend my new friend ben now that i know who you are uh anything else to say before we maybe do a little walk around and maybe lose connectivity um, no, just really uh, want people to tune in for our 250th program. Um, really appreciate working with the American Battlefield Trust on this and helping boost this very important story. Okay, great. Okay, Chris, uh, thank you all for watching. Thanks for supporting Battlefield Preservation, and he's going to show you a little bit more of the site. If we cut out, no big deal. Thank you.